Good morning, everyone. May I please ask you to take your seats? We're about to begin. Uh, so good morning again. My name is Joyce Hackme. I'm the Deputy Director of the International Security Program at Chatham House, and I have the pleasure of moderating this um, short but very important uh, session uh, looking at the Universal uh, Declaration uh, of Human Rights and mapping it to cyberspace. And this is uh, the result of a report uh, done by the American Bar Association's Internet Governance Task Force that is co-chaired by Michael Kelly, uh, who's uh, sitting uh, on my left, and David Satola, who is joining us uh, online. So uh, Michael is professor of law at Creighton University in the US, where he specializes in public international law. And David is lead counsel for innovation and technology at the World Bank, where he specializes in connectivity and cybercrime prevention strategies. Um, in addition to the two speakers who will be uh, presenting the findings from their uh, research, we also have um, uh, a discussant with us uh, today, Peggy Hicks, who is the director of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So, um, oh, sorry, what did they say? Human rights, okay, for refugees. Um, so, welcome to all of you. Um, so, we have half an hour uh, together. So the way we will do this is we will hear first from Michael and David about uh, the research, which has been just published in volume 26 of the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Law and Social Change. Um, and then we will hear uh, some reactions uh, from Peggy and perhaps a question uh, to, to the speakers, and then we'll end the session. So without uh, further ado, I will now turn to Michael. And just a quick reminder that this session is being recorded and uh, can be downloaded from the IGF website. So over to you, Mike. OK, thank you, Joyce. Uh, and if we could bring David Satola up online. He is also presenting with us. Um, Christina, please advance the slide. The, um, we want to start with a New Yorker cartoon because they can mean anything. Uh, in, in 1993, uh, you see the famous cartoon of the dog saying to the other dog on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. That was 1993. Today, in 2023, uh, this cartoon was updated. Remember when on the internet, no one knew who you were. Um, that's a paradigm shift. And we're going to talk about another paradigm shift uh, in the field of digital human rights that's coming up uh, with the advent of AI and the revolution that is on the fringe of happening. Uh, Christina, please advance. Why do, are we interested uh, in which human rights are manifesting online? Well, because that's where we spend most of our time. Uh, this Pew Research Center poll from 2019 uh, demonstrates that daily, uh, over 80% of us are online almost all the time. Uh, this used to be a generational format, uh, but as the generations go forward, we see that that is compressing at the far end. Um, you can just look around the room and see who's on devices uh, of one type or another. So you live your daily life in physical space, but you also live your daily life in digital space. Uh, and that's not always, or even mostly, work space. Um, human rights manifest in both sides of this equation. The question is, which ones follow us from physical space into digital space? How do they manifest? How are they regulated? How are they defined? And then, of course, the other end of that is how are they enforced? Uh, Christina, next slide, please. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as you all know, recently celebrated its 75th birthday, uh, which is a huge uh, passage to mark. Um, it's made up of both freedoms and rights, uh, and, and these come about in, in multiple contexts. Freedoms you're familiar with, speech, movement, assembly, religion, freedom from discrimination. Rights you're also familiar with, equality, privacy, security, work, liberty, democracy, education, property, fair trial, and nationality. But in digital space, these rights really are rendered meaningless or less useful if you don't have core rights that exist to actually animate them. And by core rights, we talk about connectivity and net neutrality. What good are digital human rights to you if you're not online? Not much. Uh, what good are digital human rights to you 
if you're not online meaningfully. And that, of course, is the net neutrality discussion. Again, not as much, and that certainly implicates the equality prong right out of the box. Uh, the other thing that we look at from a framework perspective is whether the normative equivalency paradigm is the right paradigm uh, to think about the transference of human rights from physical space to digital space. The normative equivalency paradigm is basically moving the rights into a digital format without really altering them much. Uh, other paradigms have been proposed out there. Probably the one that has gained the, the most attention uh, is actually according human rights to digital entities themselves. Um, but you get into all kinds of definitional issues uh, in that regard, and I'm not sure that we're there yet. I'm not, I don't know that we're going to be there soon, but it could be on the horizon. Nevertheless, we don't take a stand on this, which paradigm is the appropriate paradigm in our research, because our, re our research basically creates a matrix, uh, and so it is a mapping exercise um, that hopefully will be useful to policymakers, human rights advocates, uh, and jurists as well. Christina, next slide, please. Um, exhibit A is the right to be forgotten. Uh, this, in our physical space, uh, is the right to privacy. Um, and it, it's confirmed by the European Court of Justice to exist in digital space, uh, much, at least in 2015, to Google's consternation. Um, this was a case that was brought uh, by an individual in Spain who wanted some content delisted from search results uh, about him because he had already served a criminal sentence for fraud. Uh, Spain, of course, has a, a very forward-looking social justice mechanism for rehabilitation, and people are supposed to get a fresh start after they emerge from the criminal system. Um, but people kept looking up the one article about this individual that tainted his ability to do that. Uh, this was litigated all the way up to the European Court of Justice. The ECJ said, yes, uh, Google, you are required to effectuate and moderate this human right on your platform uh, and delist material that is irrelevant, no longer useful, or mistaken. Uh, Google's argument, of course, was, well, this is censorship, and shouldn't that be the job of a government, not a corporation? Um, the ECJ uh, confirmed, no, actually, Google, it's your job because we're telling you it's your job. Um, and so Google found itself not only in a moderation role but an enforcement role uh, throughout the EU uh, or throughout the, the global Google reach was later litigation uh, that I don't have time to go into today. But the internal corporate process that Google had to set up to actually have a company moderating human rights in digital space uh, was one where they had to figure out what is the interplay between human, humans and algorithms. And we haven't even inserted AI into the process at this point. Um, but review committees for each EU member state uh, were set up. Um, now there are over five million uh, web page delisting requests uh, since, this, uh, since the advent uh, of this process, um, and the vast number of them implicate content on social media, uh, specifically YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So now you're in a situation where you've got a company not only defining, moderating, and enforcing a digital human right on a space it owns in cyberspace, it's actually moderating other companies' content, right? Because when Google takes down a delist an item on Twitter, Twitter's affected. So now you've got cross-pollination happening. And is conversation happening across those platforms and across those corporations? Not at the level uh, that it should be. So this raises, obviously, a larger question on the propriety of corporate enforcement, which, of course, is by terms of service. You agree when you read every line of those terms of service before you click accept, which I know everyone in this room does, uh, that you will uh, comply with what the corporation thinks uh, about your content that you're uploading onto its platform. Christina, next slide, please. Uh, we selected um, here a uh, half dozen uh, articles from the UDHR. Uh, you can look at the, the University of Pennsylvania 
Journal of Law and Social Change article for the complete matrix of all 30 articles, just to give you a bit of a comparative perspective. Um, article one, freedom and equality, manifests usually as connectivity and net neutrality. Uh, codification is in progress in, in some states, not in others. Regulation is in progress in some states, not in others. In the United States, you see this going back and forth in a bit of a ping pong ball fashion uh, between administrations. Uh, the Obama administration moved forward on this. The Trump administration moved backward on net neutrality. The Biden administration is now moving forward again, um, not unlike some other areas uh, of law. Our Article 12, which I just covered, the right to privacy manifests as the right to be forgotten. It's codified as an EU regulation. Uh, EU member states uh, enforce it per the European Court of Justice, uh, but Google is the actual arm. It's under court order, though, to do so. So there's an interplay between the state and the company. Freedom of movement, we'll come back to. There's an asterisk there. Um, Article 17, uh, the right to property digitally manifests uh, as property in lots of different ways online. If it happens to be intellectual property, well, there's a treaty framework for that uh, through TRIPS. And so this is regulated by states and enforced by states. But if you look at speech and assembly, Articles 19 and 20, with speech, it's access to social media platforms. And the regulation is via the tech corps and your terms of service. Uh, and it matters whether or not it's a public corporation or a private corporation. If it's a public corporation, there's likely to be a process. If it's a private corporation, well, uh, Elon Musk decides whether or not you get your speech rights on his platform. Um, with assembly, it's access to groups, uh, again, via terms of service. The reason we marked Article 13, and there are a couple of other articles, is that there are no positive regulations in this area yet. There's no positive digital manifestation of this as a right or a freedom yet, frankly, because it's assumed you have freedom of movement across the internet. Well, that assumption is incorrect, and what it does is it leaves a gap. Uh, my British colleagues are familiar with the term mind the gap. Uh, yeah, mind the gap, uh, because in the absence of this, that, that leaves room for negative regulation. And authoritarian regimes can wall you off from certain areas of the internet and restrict your freedom of movement in digital space. Um, so we have to look at these gaps as well as where res uh, um, regulations are positively manifesting. Next slide, please, Christina. Okay, here are your corporate protectors of internet human rights. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of pause this here for a minute for you to, to take a look at these guys. Um, Google, of course, we saw resisted its role uh, as an enforcer and definer of, of digital human rights. Uh, but it is doing so, and I think it's doing so effectively um, under court order. Um, but I think you know, the Microsoft approach, uh, where, where the company actually embraces um, something about human rights. You all remember a few years ago, Brad Smith calling for a digital Geneva Convention. Um, that, that voluntary embrace of their new role, uh, policing cyberspace, I think is, is where we need to go if we're gonna get effectively at the 20 to 25% of human rights listed in the UDHR that have um, corporate fingerprints on it. Um, next slide, please. Um, maybe we trust those guys more than we trust this guy. Uh, the broader context, if we back up uh, a few paces uh, and we look at the back and forth between multi-stakeholderism versus multilateralism as the effective paradigm for internet governance, and we're all here in a multi-stakeholder environment, uh, authoritarian regimes want that replaced with the multilateral approach, where only states are sitting at the table, not companies, not civil society. I'm civil society. I, I'm with the American Bar Association, although I don't represent their views at this conference, I would not have a seat at this table uh, if the, the authoritarian multilateralists had their way. Why should big tech care? Because they will lose their seat at the table. Um, the conversion of them from objects to subjects of international cyber law will have a profound impact on them and on their bottom line. Uh, Russia's draft cybercrime treaty, which some of you were in the room prior to this, 
um, listened to uh, for an hour and a half, uh, when it was first introduced, was criticized as the beginning of the end for multi-stakeholderism. Um, it wasn't really so much about cybercrime as about possibly repressing human rights. Whether it undermines the Budapest Convention um, and, and whether or not it could suppress digital human rights, uh, the valiant people working on this through the UN process are discussing in New York City and Vienna every few months. Uh, and although the prior panel struck an optimistic note on that, I, I'm not sure I completely share it. Um, and so this opens up all kinds of other issues, um, the, the broader issues. And that's why now is the time to crystallize what these digital human rights are, uh, and secondly, what big tech's role is in defining, regulating, and enforcing them ahead of the coming AI revolution, because that will change everything. Um, the, there will be a paradigm shift when AI actually matures to the point that creativity-based AI platform regulation replaces logic-based algorithmic platform regulation. Let me say that again. When creativity-based AI platform regulation replaces logic-based algorithmic platform regulation, that's the sea change. And we have to get ahead of that. We have to get ahead of that for defining digital human rights, and we have to get ahead of that for defining the roles of companies in this process and convince them that it's in their interest to do so. Just as an example, a policing example, uh, AI will be a more effective cop for companies policing their platform because it's much more difficult to get around. Uh, you can get around a logic-based algorithm. Um, but the bad side of that, if you just flip it around, is it also can be a more effective tool for authoritarian regimes to repress your digital human rights. Just like everything else, this is a double-edged sword. Uh, and I should pause and let David chime in, Joyce, I think, if there's, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Peggy. I, I think in the interest of time, uh, we should probably move ahead to the commentary and hopefully leave some time for questions at the end. My only, the only remark I would underscore that Mike already made is the kind of multi-stakeholderization of the enforcement of human rights that we've seen. Um, and it's, it's on his, uh, it's on our slide seven, where um, we see that actually the, the human rights are, are being examined and enforced by private actors. And this was something that I don't think anyone anticipated uh, back when the Internet Governance Forum started. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, you and Kyoto. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David and, and Michael. And now we turn to you, Peggy. Since I messed up your introduction, why don't you introduce yourself and share your views on what's been said? Thank you. No problem. Thanks so much. Yes, I'm Peggy Hicks. I work at the UN Human Rights Office in, in Geneva, where, uh, where we're focusing on many of these issues and very grateful to Michael and David for, for taking this look at digitization of, of human rights in their scholarly work. Um, it's, it's a theme that we talk about quite a bit in Geneva. And it's been many years now since the Human Rights Council first said that the human rights that apply offline apply online. But what that means in practice, of course, has yet to be worked out. And it's, it's really interesting to look at the, this uh, mapping approach that goes through the different articles and really looks at you know, what are some manifestations of how that is developed in, in, uh, in real terms. Now, part of the reason we talk about the human rights framework as being so relevant in the digital space, I want to emphasize, and that's because uh, you, you focus, uh, Michael, on the, the battles between a multi-stakeholder and multilateral approach. I mean, part of what we think is in, crucial about the framework uh, of human rights is its universality and the fact that it involves legally binding obligations that the vast majority of states have, have um, ascribed to already. And so we, we avoid using it at our peril. It's, it's part of what can help us work through some of these challenges that are presented by, by the analysis that we've heard. Um, and it also already includes accountability mechanisms. Um, and one piece of it I really wanna emphasize, which I think is quite relevant to the research here, 
is, for example, frameworks like the UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights, which really link up the company responsibilities to the legal obligations that state has, states have. So under the Guiding Principles, you have um, three pillars. One looks at how states have a responsibility to regulate uh, how companies uh, impact on human rights in their actions. Uh, and then, of course, it has uh, the chapter that's best known goes through what, what do companies need to do to better respect human rights, including um, understanding and mitigating risks that are within their supply chains in different ways. And then the third pillar relates to accountability and remedy um, on those sides. And one of the things we've been really working on within our office is uh, there's been a lot of work done on how those principles apply in industries like extractive industries or the apparel industry, but what does it mean in the context of, of the digital space, you know, software applications that are, are mass marketed and used, you know, by, by millions of people globally? You know, what does a tech company have to do with how that software might be misused at some point in time? Um, so we've been working with a community of practice of a number of the largest tech companies uh, to really work through some of those issues and figure out how we can in better um, have them take on some of these responsibilities that are outlined in this report more effectively. Um, but I think it also goes to this tension that, that the mapping shows of, you know, how much responsibility do we want at the corporate level and what do we want states to do to better uh, tell companies how they ought to handle things. So you know, a good example is the terms of service that you referred to. Um, it is the case that companies set those terms of service, but there are things that they are legally required to do within them in terms of um, unlawful content that might be on their platforms. So you know, how far do we take those relationships and what are we looking for from governments in terms of content uh, regulation, I think is a, is a big question. Um, before I close, I have to say that one of our big concerns is that governments go too far in that regard. Um, and that's what we've seen playing out when we look at content moderation related legislation globally. The vast majority of legislation that's been adopted across the globe tends to overreach and do more to undermine human rights than to protect them. Um, so it allows uh, and almost pushes companies to take down too much speech uh, because they want to repress opposition or dissent or, or free speech in various ways. So we have to be very careful about what we ask governments to do and what we're expecting of companies. But in both places, um, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that that digitization process goes forward as we'd like to see. And I agree, the, the Cybercrime Convention is, is an interesting area in which some of these issues are playing out. We see some of the potential overbreadth in some of that, uh, some of the work that's being done under the Cybercrime Convention is, is similar to what we've seen in other uh, efforts to legislate online speech um, in areas like uh, counterterrorism efforts where sometimes those statutes as well are used um, in an overbroad way to, to repress rights. So those are just some initial comments and, and thanks again for the efforts. Thank you very much. We have. Uh five minutes uh maybe a little bit more to kind of like you know have a maybe a quick a quick uh sure. discussion um but maybe uh sort of like a follow-up question to you peggy and 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 uh maybe mike if you want to respond and david as well you talked a lot about you know first of all like you know you sort of like both outlined the complexity of of this issue and the kind of like you know the the very big importance of like getting the balance right and you know in terms of who should the honest fall on and how do you kind of like get to a place where the the responsibilities uh, uh, are clear, um, and you know, in the context of what you described, you can you know, you talked uh, about you know some of the practices that some autocratic countries are following in terms of like you know uh, uh, suppressing dissent and not respecting human rights. But we also see some regulatory um, you know approaches and initiatives coming out of liberal democracies suggesting you know some uh, uh, you know human rights concerning uh, sort of approaches from breaking encryption for you know obviously legitimate purposes and and so forth. So how how concerned are you about that and how responsive do you find these countries to the concerns that you raise with them, whether in a kind of national context or like more globally? I think it's a really good question and one that, that we're 
not only our organization, but I think many of the civil society organizations that are here today are really looking at that. I think part of what tends to happen is that governments nat naturally and understandably, rightfully, want to adopt legislation that works in their um, context. But the reality is that those models are then exported globally in contexts that can be very different, where there is not the, the same um, infrastructure to support and ensure that those laws are interpreted and used in a human rights respecting way. Um, the example that's always given is the German NetzDG stand, uh, standpoint, uh, statute, which was replicated in a variety of ways in a variety of places. But you know, we worry about that now, and the point that you made on, on uh, legislation that will potentially allow for client-side scanning, for example, which we see as incredibly problematic given the importance of end-to-end -end encryption is a really good example where we uh, understand the concerns that are leading to that type of legislation but feel very strongly that um, adoption of, of measures in that direction could um, have really deleterious impacts uh, globally and could lead to a much broader problem with uh, 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 the limitations or undermining of encryption. Thank you. And Mike, if you can answer this question yeah. while also addressing what could be done in order to sort of understand and avoid those unintended consequences. Right. Uh, well, the, um, at, at base, uh, and this of course is, you know, hand in glove with the, with the policy approach from the United Nations, by virtue of the fact that you're a homo sapiens, you get the same bag of rights doesn't matter what your race is, your gender, your religion, or whatever. And everyone is theoretically bound by that in physical space. Now we know that's not always true, and that always doesn't play out. But what about in digital space? Does everyone get the same bag of rights by virtue of the fact that you're a digital homo sapiens? Well, what is a digital homo sapiens? Is your avatar, Peggy, going to get the same rights that you do, uh, or Joyce? Uh, or, you know, does your Facebook account go on after you die, and does it continue to have the rights that you enjoyed while you were alive? We're in a new frontier here, um, and it's, it is a huge balancing question, but it also is a definitional question. Where are we? And, and that's why the definitions need to be nailed down before the AI revolution comes, and it's coming very quickly. So there's a temporal component to this that, that we really have to be mindful of. David, are you still online? Yes, I am. If, if I could just add one very quick comment, and it, it ho hopefully relates back to something that Peggy mentioned about the universality of rights. And I think one of the things that intrigued Mike and I when we went into this research was, does the migration of our daily lives into cyberspace in any way challenge that very basic concept of the universality of rights. And while we recognize that context matters, and again, to Peggy's point about you know, the Brussels effect and other uh, national or regional laws that have been exported and incorporated out of context, does that also pose a threat to the universality of rights online. And so we, we don't have the answer to those questions, but I think they're worth thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, David. And maybe one final question to you, Peggy. Uh, you mentioned the Cybercrime Convention and the OHCHR has been quite active on that front, you know, publishing sort of commentary and, and making some uh, observations on the content and how the, the convention is, is proceeding. Can you share with us sort of your latest view on where the, the process is? I don't know if, the, if you yourself cover that specifically or not, but maybe sort of share with us what you think about where we are at the moment and what sort of, you know, where do you think we might be heading? No, oh, thanks. It's a good question but I smiled only because I don't think it's a one-minute question. It's, it's, it's a bit com uh, more complex than that. We, we do still have some, some issues. We've been raising consistently some concerns over how the, the um, convention might have the same sort of overbreadth problem, um, the fact that the types of offenses that are included are those that are punishable by three to four years for us, for example, is something that raises questions because we see people being, you know, put in prison for a single tweet uh, for three to five, uh, four years. So, you know, I think there are some concerns that are still there in terms of criminalization and, and in terms of the breadth of investigative powers and the, the effective safeguards that need to be there. Um, but of course, as has been said, the process is still ongoing and there'll be lots of opportunity for those who, 
who share with us those concerns, including a number of states, to, to put them on the table. And, you know, hopefully the negotiation process will continue in a way that, that moves the, the convention in the right direction. Brilliant, thank you. And I guess maybe the silver lining from all of that is that the process has raised awareness about the complexity of, of the issues and, and the kind of, um, you know, the potential sort of for abuse uh, when it comes to not the, just the procedural powers, but also like a very broad scope of criminalization. So I think uh, with that, we will uh, end the session. It was a short session, but very important. Um, thank you, Michael, David, and, and Peggy for joining us today. And thank you for everyone who attended. And yeah, we'll okay. see you later. Thank you.